Uh, now we will have uh, a presentation from Professor Mespalu, head of the Estonian Biobank and uh, also a, a, a real leader in uh, promoting uh, activities uh, as president of the European Society of the Hu Human Genetics nominated as the Estonian European of the Year, and also with several honors and uh, prizes. So uh, please, uh, Andres, uh, you have the floor now. Hello? Do you hear me? Yes. All yes. Right. Thank you very much for the invitation. And, uh, you know, we just heard a story from uh, US and uh, I'm coming from Estonia, which is like a small country, 1.3 million people only. But uh, now, how can I move these slides? This is it. But, you know, 20 years ago, we had a vision that we should uh, really implement the genomics and genetics into healthcare. And we decided that, look, before we start treating patients, we have to know what is a normal variation in the genome. And one way of doing it is just to create a biobank and analyze them all as uh, much as possible. So we, we created a biobank and we, um, up to now we have a little more than 200,000 people in the biobank. And, uh, you know, we are recruiting every day, but, um, but it's about 20% of adult population starting from 18 years old. So we are, it's a kind of quite rich, uh, data rich biobank. And we have now uh, everybody's genotyped. And uh, last week we signed a contract with one Finnish company. We will get uh, all 200,000 people analyzed by Nucleic NMR, and we get uh, 250 uh, molecules and um, compounds. You know, also concentrations and everything. So basically, we are we are having pretty good view what the genomic variation is in our country and what the health status is. Of course, we also have a law, and you know, as you see, the law tells that of course you have to collect data and then analyze. But at the end of the day, you have to use this data to improve public health, and this was our vision for personalized medicine. So, of course, uh, it's very useful if your country has uh, all everything is electronic, everything is digital, and so. Without uh, digitalization, I would say it is not possible to uh, implement um, personalized medicine, which really reaches to the individuals and um, and uh, stratifies the people according to the disease risks. So this is what is really useful. And um, and the other thing was that Estonia is a small country, so it might be that our population is just like in Kusamo in Finland, very isolated and and lots of individual variants, which are not really having any meanings uh, in the rest of Europe. But you see, Baltic countries, North, West Russia, Poland, they are all in one group, but the, most of the Europe is here and south of Italy over here. So you see, we if we just put the same data to the global map with, with Asian and African countries, then Europeans are still just one spot. So we are pretty close and related to each other which is um, also good to know. We published it more than 10 years ago and it was very good to see that what we are doing here in Estonia, it also matters uh, in other places in um, in Europe. So just short picture how we do the biobank. We, uh, we have volunteer based longitudinal biobank and you see the men and women and the colored area shows how many people we have proportionally in each age group in the biobank. You see more women come to biobanks than men, and uh, we are losing a little bit uh, old people because, you know, we call them gene donors and, and they mix it up with blood donors who have to be healthy and, you know, nice. But uh, when I went to radio telling that, look, the more disease you have, the better, you know, it was probably too late already. So, but still represents quite a uh, good uh, the full population which we can study. So we get uh, data, clinical data from different um, databases, and um, we are updating regular basis. 
And also we have a questionnaire data about, uh, you know, health behavior and, uh, and also uh, activities. So at the end of the day, we have disease trajectories from basically from birth to the end. And, you know, somebody, uh, you know, joins the biobank here, but these are also ICD-10 codes and here are prescription drugs. So we basically have a very good view what's really going on and uh, I have a longitudinal view what uh, what was before they rec <coughs> we recruited him and what will happen during the recruitment. We started recruitment in 2002 and, yes, and uh, you know, there are average uh, follow-up period is uh, more than 10 years already. So what people think about it? You, you see, uh, people actually support what we are doing and uh, it it's because we have been doing like 20 years public educational program. So we are just going to media telling what's the genomics is, what's the genetic is, how we are all different and what the disease is and so on and so forth. And so basically, I guess this is why we get uh, such a strong support from the public. So if you go to personalized medicine, like, um, you know, there are many ways to uh, to define it, but um, I take it quite a kind of practical uh, way. We have a rare disease, where precision diagnostics like full genome and full exome sequencing is very useful nowadays, and uh, full exome sequencing is already paid by centralized. We have single payer uh, healthcare, and um, last seven years already they are paying for full exome sequences. And actually, if we don't get the data here, we can send the samples to Broad Institute and they are sequencing full genome for us. And we are collaborating with, um, with Broad very uh, closely uh, and uh, it's very good, you know. So cancer is, of course, a difficult thing. And uh, we already you mentioned also that there are monoclonal antibodies which are working very well. But, you know, cancer is uh, also a sporadic cancer. And this is what we can also called like a common disease. And, and this is where our most, uh, we are focusing mostly on this common complex disease, which we are trying to use a personal prevention, we call it polygenic risk score based personal prevention. And of course, one of the genomics drug response is um, very nice, but I have no time to, to um, describe and show data on this one. So what do we, in, in our approach, what we propose to the government and the government is supporting and paying for is we, we sequenced uh, 3,000 people in order to get the reference database showing that, look, these are the variants. And now if we do the array, array is less than 20 euros a piece and we're using Illumina GSA array and then impute arrays and actually can produce um, the full genome sequence, which can be used in polygen risk score uh, calculations. And it actually is not very expensive. We got from government 50 euros to recruit the patient, uh, not patient, to recruit the person, to get the blood sample, to get informed consent, to, to get DNA, to genotype, and put everything into the database and uh, after QC. So this is it's not much, you know. If you think for 50 euros, you don't get a, a nice meal even at a restaurant. So basic, but now nobody's going to restaurant anymore. You just can probably get more. At home, but uh, but this is not expensive. So I give you like a technical thing, like three examples. The first one is a kind of a, uh, familiar hypercholesterolemia, which is uh, people call it also rare disease. It's one out of two hundred, but this is very undiagnosed disease, and usually these people see the doctor first time in emergency uh, unit. So and then it's type two diabetes and and breast cancer. So with FH, the thing is that lots of <coughs> people have, um, uh, you know, what we did, we just took three genes only, like LD, uh, LDL receptor, Apobib, uh, PCSK9 gene, and took uh, uh, lots of uh, functional variants. And, um, and then what this uh, thing is that you have lots of people who have a variant, uh, uh, who have a variant uh, positive, but um, but uh, LDL cholesterol is is not very high. So uh, family physician is not taking this as a risk because uh, this is a borderline uh, values, and <coughs> they just tell, look, uh, run more, eat less, and it goes back to normal. 
but it, it will not, you know. And so now what we proposed, look, we go to the biobank, we invite people back with these mutations, and you have to look into cardiology hospital, what is looking like. So what happened? We invited people back and, <coughs> and you know, this 17 person had no diagnosis whatsoever. Hypercholesteremia was 21, and only three persons had a FH diagnosis. After staying in cardiology hospital, most of them got FH diagnosis. And, and this is very, actually, I tell you, cardiologists were very uh, surprised. And, uh, and uh, you know, at the beginning, they always said, look again at genetics, and we know how to treat our patients. But after seeing this, they were so fond that they now started their own registry, and they really would like to use the genetics. So, of course, treatment, they had no treatment at all, but now after that, they got statins. So, it's a practical value. Genomics gives practical value and saves lives. Okay, so polychain risk score. This is kind of a new concept in principle because before we could really analyze uh, uh, across the genome all variants, like hundreds of thousands of variants, so it was not possible, but now it is. And so basically, PRS, polychain risk score, is, this is a number. And I predict that pretty soon most people know this number. They know this number as well as they know today's systolic blood pressure or their, I know, blood sugar value or something. But biomarkers, and this is what we are born with. You can't change it. And this is day number one, even before with you. But biomarkers, which are, these are what happens later. It's based on genomics and genetics, but it comes later. You, you might have very nice, uh, uh, you have very high PRS, but if you're 40 years old, your blood pressure might be quite normal, but you are having great risk. So this is the thing. Of course, polygen risk score is not, uh, it's still developing concept. Yes, uh, methods are developed all the time and getting better and so on and so forth. So this is not something which is fixed. There is no kind of golden um, rule or the best method, every month there is a new best method, basically. So what it is, you have a, you know, depends how many markers you take, but you take like uh, thousands. And then, uh, and they are all coming from genome-wide association studies, and all markers are not uh, equal. You remember this, uh, all animals are equal, but some of them are more equal. Here also, all SNPs are fine, but some of them are more equal because they are having, they are producing more risk and they are more important in terms of developing disease. But but you can use it if you put the weights to this and you can get something which is, uh, you know, statistically uh, analyzable. And we published it already five years ago how we are doing it and of course we're improving it, but the first paper came out in genome medicine. And <clears throat> And uh, so what we're looking, we're looking at is individuals of high risk. This is normal distribution and we're looking mostly here. But of course, now we are looking also here because here people are protected. And uh, so we have to look also the ones which are protected. So now can I move? Okay, so this was a paper. And, uh, and what is important here, nobody can handle it. Uh, otherwise you have to use the decision support tools. So uh, computer programs. So, you know, that genomics and uh, human genetics and, you know, uh, medicine, it, it's getting more like mathematics. And uh, you have to train people who can understand uh, medicine and can understand database, big data and statistics and everything. So it's a completely new uh, way of training people. And, and these, are, these people are really very few. So what do we... We also had to train our people and just to see how it works. We have um, we had a program which is over now. We re we returned data to 3,000 people from the biobank based on this uh, polygenic risk score. And here is something like uh, we tried different ways of doing it, but one way is like this. And it's type 2 diabetes, somebody who is uh, male, uh, you know, 54 years old. And if you just uh, uh, so, what's, uh, if, if you are now here and you see this future, and you know, if your 10 year risk developing type 2 diabetes is 2% if you are, if you are here. But, but now it depends. If you just lose weight, 
it can even go down. But if you gain weight, it can go up. And turns out that this is something people feel that this is about them. And uh, of course, family physicians were counseling them and, uh, and they were very actually uh, mm, happy that uh, even men actually were listening and they were really trying to lose weight and so on. So uh, we think that this is something, mm, you know, the overall opinion is that people don't change their lifestyle, whatever you tell them. But uh, it's partially true. But if you have a personalized data based on genomics, people are more uh, ready to, to change the lifestyle, but you need to give them some help. I would say some health coaching is needed. You know, health coach as, you know, they don't need seven years in or six years in medical school and, you know, four years in residency. These are from nursery school, good combination skills and can really help people. Let's take the next thing. Uh, next is um, breast cancer, bad disease. Uh, of course, we know about BRCA1 and 2, but um, there are uh, we are using more than 900 S&P variants. We have 700 new cases per year and um, and it's increasing. So if we just analyze using the PRS, all the uh, patients, what uh, all the uh, patients, so we, uh, incident cases in, uh, in our biobank, we had uh, in this age group about 33,000. So it turns out that we have high risk group here and low risk and this is uh, population average. So some people have high risk of breast, some people low. But if you just make it easier, so we have a, we have top 5% of policy and risk score. And these are, this is here. And the blue is a population-based average. We know today and we know that 20 years ago that every woman has about 6% of risk to get the breast or ovarian cancer before she gets 70 years old. But for this 5%, all women, this happens 53 or 52. So almost 20 years earlier. And, and uh, in most countries, the mammography starts at age 50. And for these ladies, this might come, this letter might come too late. So this is definitely something which can uh, um, be enough, a big reason enough just to change the uh, screening programs just for based on genetic data, certain group of women should be invited earlier. So this is our uh, program. We just return data, of course, type to diabetes, breast cancer, coronary artery disease, but some other stuff also, like even cystic fibrosis. We wanted to and pharmacogenomics. We wanted to see how people actually can handle the data and. And what is the best way of doing it? And how long it takes uh, to explain the, what's the counseling, counseling, how long it would take. And counseling, uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes was uh, already enough. But this is, of course, quite a long. Nowadays, uh, normal GP can get only probably 10 minutes just uh, for patient. And um, But this is something um, people like very much. So what we did, we, um, we uh, uh, interviewed them before counseling after and six months later and you know it's uh, basically people that it didn't cause harm it was right decision to participate and they didn't regret that they were participating in this study so of course this was a biobank based study we have uh, also cl two clinical uh, studies uh, will be over next month in march uh, last three years and these are already uh, was an important study because we could really introduce the full concept to hospitals and hospital databases and the hospital doctors and and so basically also coronary artery disease was one disease and and we used 10 percent of our uh, family physicians in this project and they were trained a little bit more and you know they can handle it and uh, they don't have to learn genomics and genetics they get this from this uh, data support system uh, uh, information, what they have to really explain to people. And it's not too bad, as they can handle it. And uh, it's like MRI, you know, uh, GP did, took the course of physics or just uh, explain what the radiologist wrote into this report. So it's, um, it's not, um, of course, you have to have some uh, training, but um, it's doable. 
Of course, there's lots of issues also because um, because of course of all, first of all, you have to spend some money, and the hospital directors are looking always Excel table and this is here in red or or, or, or blue, so it's uh, you have to find the way to do this infrastructure. And government put now money just to recruit people into biobank, chant up some more basically, and uh, and have this data available for the. Uh, medical system. So of course we have not done yet because so far it's still university uh, run project, but now government already has their own personalized medicine program and uh, 2023 everything, uh, not everything, but first things should be on the table of the real doctors in the real medical uh, institutions. So, but uh, it also gives patients more power. And patients are more knowledgeable because, uh, you know, they know, they are following, and they all have some their own disease. There's not, uh, nobody's uh, absolutely healthy. And um, if you just, uh, if you have no disease, then something with pharmacogenomics. You have a variant which you know, really influence which mm, drug you can use or cannot use. And, um, and also health issues are important because how to, make sure that people can have control on their data. In our country, people control their data, people own their data. So they have to uh, allow uh, data to be used for science or, or just to share. So this is people's power. And But at the end of the day, we need better databases. We have to share in because we are all similar. And uh, some variants are so rare, we have to know what the variants are and what they are causing. So it's a, uh, it's a constant uh, uh, development and you have to be, uh, you know, on the same level what research is going on. So you have to read uh, basically, you know, the hospital kind of a group of people have to read the, all the papers every week uh, and make sure that all the information is going into decision support uh, software that uh, Sometimes new variants can increase your risk, and sometimes new variants can decrease your risk. So it's not only bad, you have to use it. So I, I would say that large prospective buyback cohorts make it possible to move towards personalized genetic risk prediction and use it in general medical practice. But lots of things has to be done, but um, I think it's already convincing enough to start using it. And in Europe, uh, three weeks ago, uh, February the 4th, they published, European Commission published a um, uh, big um, um, document called Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. This is for the next uh, seven to ten years. And the um, mission port of cancer had really big impact to, uh, to develop this document and polygen risk scores and uh, liquid biopsy and uh, all these are in uh, as a personalized or early detection people stratification according to disease risks so these are all there so i guess this is an important milestone and um, now all countries can take a look and think look this if this comes from already as a political document then we should really start doing it so this is surviving people and um, and these are our uh, supporters and my colleagues who did the most of the work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andres and Rupat, for your outstanding presentation.